So we'll start with a question um, from the ortho bullet. A 26 year old male has an elbow injury after a fall from a skateboard. He has a valgus and supination injury. And what they are showing you on the computerized tomographic scan is a anterior fracture of the coronoid. These are sagittal cuts across the coronoid. And you see it's just a fracture of the coronoid tip. A fracture of the coronoid tip to me represents the sequelae of an elbow dislocation. If you see, for example, an isolated anterior fracture of the coronoid, you know that joint has come out of socket and subluxated anteriorly. I liken it to the bank heart bony injury of the shoulder, which signifies a dislocation. The question suggests that this is a type 1, as I'll discuss, or a small fracture of the tip. And we see that most commonly in the setting of a dislocation. And to answer the question, this is seen most commonly in the setting of a dislocation with a radial head fracture and a small fracture of the coronoid tip. This has been, uh, the term has been coined, the terrible triad injury. Um, Bob Hotchkiss many years ago coined this term, the triad being an elbow dislocation, a radial head fracture, and a fracture of the anterior tip of the coronoid. And he used the term terrible because these for many years had terrible outcomes, a terrible prognosis. But for the purposes of this question, we're talking about those very small tip fractures, which are again seen in the setting of elbow dislocation. As I said, the coronoid fracture by definition means that the elbow has subluxated. It's the humerus that slides anteriorly, injuring the coronoid. And often this is seen in the setting of subluxation, dislocation, associated injuries, and ligamentous disruptions about the elbow. Um, the coronoid uh, fractures, when you see from the lateral, the small tip fractures are often thought of as avulsion fractures. But it turns out that the brachialis inserts well distal to the tip of the coronoid. And the capsule inserts four to five millimeters distal to the tip. So these are not, again, avulsion fractures. These are shear or impaction injuries from the humerus sliding anteriorly, essentially slipping out of the joint and as the humerus comes out, it shears off the tip of the coronoid. So these are, again, shear fractures of the coronoid. Um, there are different types of coronoid fractures. This is a review I wrote many years ago. It shows you how old I am. But essentially, there are the anterior tip fractures from dislocation. As I'll discuss, those can come down a bit on toward the middle of the coronoid. There are fracture dislocations of the elbow that have large coronoid fragments, essentially the entire coronoid. And then there's one additional coronoid injury termed a posteromedial or posteromedial rotatory injury in which the anteromedial facet of the coronoid fractures. And that's an entirely different subset of coronoid injury that we will discuss. Here is a uh, associated injuries of the terrible triad. Again, coronoid, radial head fracture, and of course the dislocation with ligament disruption. And as I stated, it was termed terrible for triad because the complication rates of these injuries can be very high. The coronoid sits anterior again about the elbow. Lying next to the coronoid is the radial head. And as we'll see, the radial head and the coronoid work in concert to form an anterior wall or an anterior buttress to the elbow. There is an additional medial facet that I will show you, and that's important as a medial rudder or a medial facet or buttress to the ulnohumeral joint, and that can be independently injured in isolated coronoid fractures. So we see, let's go back one. We see, that, again, the anterior buttress effect of the coronoid and the ulnohumeral joint, which essentially involves the coronoid, is really the most important aspect of the elbow, which on a pure anatomical um, um, foundation is just a hinge. The elbow is a hinge, bringing one's hand toward one's mouth for feeding. 
So the question here is what portion of the coronoid is most commonly associated with a terrible triad? We've sort of beaten this one. It's of course a tip fracture of the coronoid. Again, not an avulsion, but a shear as the humerus slips out of the joint. And it's usually a two or a three millimeter anterior coronoid injury. Um, the coronoid classifications classically were one, two, and three by Reagan and Mori. There's been newer classifications by Steinman and O'Driscoll. I will tell you that I still believe that traditional one, two, and three classification is very useful, useful from a mechanistic standpoint and useful from the setting of treatment. A type one we've talked about, a type two coronoid fracture typically involves a fracture up to approximately 50% of the coronoid height these are not always transverse injuries in this coronal plane of the form, so I will tell you that you can have oblique fractures, but for the most part, ones are tip fractures, two involve up to 50%, and then the third fracture, the base fracture, is one involving the entire coronoid. The base fracture more commonly seen with the comminuted olecranon fractures that were just shown in the previous lecture, often a trans fracture dislocation, often a montasia variant in which the humerus comes through the ulna, breaks the olecranon, and breaks off the coronoid into a separate fragment. As I mentioned, there's other classification systems. This is a classification system by Sean O'Driscoll, and I'll tell you that you can really get a headache trying to understand. There's one, two, three, there's subtypes. I think Sean really taught us something special with the classification, and if I use this arrow, you can see that number one represents the anteromedial facet. It's something we didn't appreciate until probably eight to ten years ago. And the anteromedial facet is something you don't see well on a lateral radiograph. It's a medial projection off of the coronoid. It provides the medial wall to the ulnohumeral joint, and on its exterior, there's the medial collateral ligament attachment to the sublime tubercle. So it's very important, not only from a bony standpoint for buttressing the medial elbow, but it's important from a ligamentous standpoint. And it's that anteromedial facet isolated fracture that has really allowed us to better appreciate some of the complexities of these coronoid fractures. These are not typically um, subtle injuries, the only one that can be subtle, for example, you have a football player get injured on the field and they come out and you have relatively limited motion, the x-rays look normal except for that little small anterior coronoid shear fracture. We know that joint has subluxated, so it's again, the, the, the subtlety is not usually there, but you can have very subtle changes on the x-ray in the setting of more significant bony and soft tissue disruption. Here's a question, what is the physical examination finding associated with this injury? And to me, this represents the classic postromedial varus injury. And you see here where I'm showing you by the arrow, unlike elbow dislocations that we'll cover, in which the form supinates away from the humerus, in this particular injury, the form pronates and the humerus comes down like a battering ram, and it can shear off in an isolated way that anteromedial facet. It's not really well appreciated on the lateral view, but if you look here, the joint is subluxated. It's a rotatory subluxation. And as the humerus comes in and knocks off this anteromedial facet, you have an obligate distraction force laterally and the lateral collateral ligament typically fails in tension on these postromedial injuries. Again, just the appreciation of this injury is what's important. You see sometimes on a frontal view a double density, or you see that the joint line, the onohumeral joint line, is not congruous from medial to lateral. That sort of keys you in to start looking at the anteromedial facet. So the answer to this question, again, is a varus postromedial rotatory injury. Again, Sean O'Driscoll described this in his classification of coronoid fractures, which I think is most important for teaching us to appreciate this particular injury, because this injury can be subtle,
And if this injury is missed, it's a terrible problem because now you have a joint that has slipped and has subluxated and you get very early degenerative changes in wear of the ulnohumeral joint. So this again just uh, describes this anteromedial facet of the coronoid, this varus posteromedial injury, and again the fact that the lateral collateral ligament typically fails, but now it fails in tension, not in shear. So coronoid fractures can be um, uh, defined by, of course, history. Coronoid fractures, we again see medial or lateral instability. Most of the time, we're not performing instability stress tests. We're getting frontal, lateral, and oblique radiographs, and sometimes advanced imaging to better appreciate the uh, particular injury involved. This is, again, another very good example of this posteromedial uh, uh, shear injury. This is a varus uh, pronation mechanism in which the humerus comes down, shears off this piece of the anteromedial facet. Very important, and it's a little difficult to see, but the lateral ligament, again, fails in tension. So we need frontal, lateral, and oblique projections. And if there's any question regarding the congruency or the um, lack of a congruent joint, you need to get a CT scan. It's an obligate way to better understand the injury. It's again discussed, and we heard that earlier. And I particularly for these injuries like the three-dimensional reformatted images, the surface renderings of the elbow in which you can rotate around and really appreciate the displacement and the uh, mechanism in which the elbow has been injured. Um, immobilization is uh, most common in the acute setting, no matter what type of coronoid injury you have. I will tell you that early range of motion is really most indicated for that type 1 injury in which the elbow is stable, and we'll discuss this in the setting of elbow dislocation. The type 2 and the type 3 injuries most commonly require surgical intervention, so we're not talking about splint followed by early range of motion. The approach to the coronoid surgically really is dictated by the injury. For the most part, the type 1 coronoid injury seen in the setting of dislocation or in the terrible triad really needs no particular uh, attention. It's a sign that the elbow has dislocated, as I mentioned, the brachialis, the capsule, and sir distal, and that small anterior piece of the coronoid in no way um, imparts instability to the elbow. So there's not much benefit from trying to fix the type 1 injury. When you have a terrible triad with a type 2 injury in which the radial head has been injured, most commonly you will be removing that radial head to be replacing it with a metallic implant. And as such, once the radial head is out, you have direct visualization and access to the coronoid. And in this way, you can fix a type 2 coronoid from the lateral side. When you have a medial facet injury, you really have to approach that from the medial side. You cannot get to the anteromedial facet from the lateral side. So I will tell you that um, most of the time we're working laterally for the type 2 and medially for the type 1. The posterior e visualization of the coronoid is really only uh, to be discussed in the setting of those complex olecranon fractures, whereas I will show you can work through the fracture to reduce the large coronoid to the shaft and then you're left with a two-part fracture involving the olecranon. So um, the only other thing on this slide is the words hinged external fixation. I will tell you that most of us have moved away from the hinges toward static external fixation. To me, the hinge is not as important as just some external neutralization to keep the joint from subluxating. Very rare in the acute setting only if you're unable to, to secure stable fixation, if you're unable to leave the operating room with a stable joint, you have to do something to keep the elbow reduced and concentric, and you're probably adding an external frame in those rare situations. As I mentioned, if you want to address the anteromedial facet,
you have to come in for a medial deep approach. There's two different approaches that can be used. There's a flexor pronator split approach that's been popularized in the elbow release literature. Bob Hotchkiss terms this the medial over the top. I will tell you the more direct approach to the coronoid from the medial side that brings you directly down on the anteromedial facet is to simply use the floor of the cubital tunnel. So you have to open up and move the ulnar nerve. You have to take some of the branches of the ulnar nerve to the anterior flexor carpionaris. You really have to strip the ulnar nerve almost more distally than you're used to if you perform cubital tunnel surgery. And then you retract gently the ulnar nerve posteriorly and you retract the flexor pronator muscle anteriorly and you'll come right down on the anteromedial facet. You'll see suture mentioned here. I tend to use um, internal fixation, small screws, small little buttress plates. Even a 1.5 millimeter buttress plate can be helpful to hold down that anteromedial facet. There are fragment specific pre bent plates that can be used. Sometimes these are more difficult than to simply bend a 1.5 or a 2 millimeter plate. And again, from the medial side, you're trying to hold that piece in. The medial collateral ligament attaches to the piece, which is pulling tension on the piece. So you're really using this as a buttress or a anti-glide plate to hold that anteromedial facet in place. Um, it is very important to understand, again, that the lateral collateral ligament does fail in tension. So as seen here, a bone anchor was used to repair the collateral ligament back to the humerus. The ligament almost always comes off of its origin, off of the humerus. And then it talks about avoiding shoulder abduction. It's something very important to understand when you're dealing with any injury to the elbow, and a dislocation, or a lateral collateral ligament injury. When you raise your elbow away from your body and you abduct your shoulder, gravity with the form is putting a tremendous varus load on the elbow. And if these patients are, for example, large and their resting position is with the arm ab or the shoulder abducted, what you end up doing is having a resting tension on the lateral side. And in the setting of this posteromedial injury, you end up with compression on the medial side. And it's very subtle here, but here we have a buttress plate and we have an anchor. But if you look carefully here, you see that this joint is not congruous from medial to lateral. And this elbow was already slipping back into that compression medially in tension laterally. If you think about it, reconstituting the lateral ligament brings the radial head back to the humerus and it essentially takes tension off of this side. It, it neutralizes the compressive forces medially. So a lateral ligament repair is very important in this setting, and you want to try to limit these patients from having a varus load. Even picking up a gallon of milk with your arm away from your body puts a massive varus load on the elbow. So it is very important to have the patients understand. It's very important to try to limit them from using their arm away from their body, especially with anything in their hand. And again, you'll see again and again early active motion, I would say that in any type of elbow injury, we always think to move the elbow early because it's been shown that prolonged immobilization may lead to a higher incidence of stiffness. But the last thing you want is to lose a congruous joint. It's always better to have a stiff congruous joint than an incongruous joint, whether it's stiff or whether it's loose because this is a problem that we cannot recover from. But if we have a stiff congruous joint, we can always do an elbow release, releasing the elbow for mobility long term. And the older I get, the longer I keep any type of potentially unstable or compromised elbow in a cast or in a static external fixator. Again, the worst problem is to see the joint starting to subluxate is seen here because you really can't recover very well from that complication. Um, as I mentioned, you can see the type 3, the base coronoid fractures in the setting of the uh, more common 
trans olecranon fracture dislocations or montasia fractures involving the coronoid and the anterior or posterior aspect of the olecranon. When you have this injury, rather than coming in from the medial side, you can slide along the ulna. You can slide medially to come in, but most easily is to pull the olecranon out of the way and reduce this from the undersurface. Even if you have provisional fixation with a pin, when you put your posterior plate on, you'll be able to place posterior to anterior screws into that anterior coronoid fragment. So again, these type three injuries involving the base are unlike uh, the injuries seen with fracture dislocations. They're unlike the posteromedial medial facet. They're usually seen in the setting of these more complex fracture dislocations of the joint. Um, the complications to me, for the most part, evolve around stiffness and recurrent instability. An early failure and recurrent instability, you never want. Stiffness for me is, again, something you can recover from. I don't get very concerned or excited about patients who have motion loss after any type of fracture or fracture dislocation of the elbow. As long as the joint is congruous, we can always come back and get mobility. So um, to me, the worst combination is an unstable or, or, or joint that is not congruous and stiff. A congruous joint, not really something that makes me in any way concerned. This x-ray, of course, makes me concerned because now we have an incongruous onohumeral joint and you cannot easily recover from that. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.